Legacy Project came about through my interest in the novels of the Bronte sisters, Charlotte, Emily and Anne. I was aware of their Irish connections, that their father, the Reverend Patrick Bronte, was from Rathfryland in Northern Ireland, and that Charlotte married her father's curate, the Reverend Arthur Bell Nichols. When I first visited their home, the parsonage in Haworth in Yorkshire, it was a wonderful experience, but looking around at the various artefacts, I became acutely aware that many of the objects were previously owned by Charlotte's husband, Arthur Bell Nichols, and were preserved for over 40 years in Hill House in Banagher. Arthur was very protective of the Bronte family's possessions, but after his death, his second wife, Mary Anna, cautiously released the collection to the market, prioritising the Parsonage Museum. I'm glad to say that Mrs. A. B. Nichols of Banagher, the widow of the late Mr. Arthur Bell Nichols, was first wife to Charlotte Bronte, has been good enough to permit the Bronte Society to purchase for a merely nominal sum some of the most interesting relics in her possession connected with that famous family. It was so obvious that the Bronte Museum was the best place for such relics. They will receive it, moreover, from the charge, not unjustly made, that the Bronte Society so far has collected relics of too trivial a nature. In recent years, Banagher began to flag the historical connections with the Brontes and the historian, James Scully, installed information panels on the walls of Arthur's home, which is Hill House, now Charlotte's Way, Guest House, and across the road at St Paul's Church where Arthur is buried. James has done sterling work in researching and bringing to public attention the story of Charlotte and Arthur. Charlotte was the only one of her siblings to marry and following her death in 1855 and that of her father six years later, Arthur returned to his native banner, bringing with him the contents of the parsonage in Haworth. This included manuscripts, books, pictures, furniture, and his father in law's two dogs, Cato and Plato. To investigate further, I revisited Howard Parsonage to discuss my project with its curator and Instay. I then made contact with the Banagher Crafting Group, and in 2019, with the support of its members, we began to collaborate and stitch panels narrating the story of the Irish connection with the Bronte family. This group of crafters and their expertise are central to the creation and development of this project. Sewing had a special place in the Bronte household. Each of the five Bronte sisters made a decorative embroidery panel known as a sampler. These textile pieces demonstrated literacy and knowledge of different sewing stitches. They are a traditional indication of class and education as only people who could afford the time, materials and instruction could generate samplers. Sadly, the two oldest girls in the Bronte household, Maria and Elizabeth, died when they were 10 and 11 years of age from an illness contracted at the clergy daughter's boarding school. Readers of Jane Eyre will be familiar with their story. Yet, the only remaining record we have of Maria and Elizabeth is the embroidered sampler that they made and these are now on show in the Bronte Museum. The parsonage at Haworth was home to the Bronte family since April 1820. It is a two-storey, five-bay Georgian house. The Reverend Patrick Bronte was 43 years when he took up this pastoral role and his wife Maria was 38. The couple had six children, Maria, Elizabeth, Charlotte, Branwell, Emily Jane and Anne. The parsonage remained the home of the Bronte family for 41 years. It was closely associated with the children's creativity and is where the Bronte siblings wrote their poetry and novels. Initially, it was a place of great sadness as Mrs. Maria Bronte died there within 18 months of the family's arrival. The house belonged to the church and it was tied to Patrick's post as perpetual curate at St. Michael's of All Angels. This living is what is here called a benefice or perpetual curacy. It is mine for life, no one can take it away from me. The only difference between it and a vicarage is that in a vicarage the salary arises from tithes and in the living I have it arises from the rent of freehold estates, which I like much better. My salary is not large, 
is only about 200 a year. But in addition to this, 200 a year, I have a good house, which is mine for life also, and it is rent free. The children's mother, Maria, was born in Penzance in Cornwall, where her father was a tea merchant and a property owner. She had a cultured upbringing, attending musical evenings and other social engagements at Penzance. She met Patrick when she was staying with her uncle's family at Woodhouse School. Patrick was introduced by his friend, the Reverend William Morgan, who was engaged to Maria's cousin, Jane Fennell. Patrick and Maria soon began walking out together. When they became engaged, it was decided to have a double wedding. This took place on the 29th of December, 1812, at St. Oswald's Church in West Yorkshire. And it was a highly unusual arrangement. But this was to be no ordinary wedding, but a double one shared with Jane Fennell and William Morgan, for which a special license had to be procured. John Fennell would give away his daughter and his niece to two clergymen, would act alternately as bridegroom and officiating minister, and the two cousins would be both bridesmaid and bride. The early years of Patrick's life are remarkable. The son of a farmer, he was born on St. Patrick's Day in 1777, in a two-roomed cottage in Northern Ireland. He was the eldest of 10 children. Patrick quickly realized that education was the way out of poverty. He set up his own school for local children when he was still in his teens. His good work came to the attention of the Reverend Thomas Pye, an influential and well-connected evangelical minister. Pye hired Patrick as tutor for his family, but he saw the young man's potential and encouraged him to apply for a third level education. Ty suggested that Patrick attend his own alma mater, St John's College, Cambridge, where Patrick gained entry as a scholarship student known as a sizer. It was around this time that Patrick changed his Irish sounding name, Pronte, to Bronte. His hero, Lord Nelson, was awarded the title Duke of Bronte in 1798 for his services to King Ferdinand. In 1821, when Mrs Bronte first became ill, her older sister Elizabeth came to help. When Maria died in September of the same year, Elizabeth remained in Howarth to look after her small nieces and nephew. This was originally thought to be a temporary arrangement as Patrick hoped to marry again, but this did not happen and Elizabeth became the surrogate mother to the Bronte children. Aunt Bradmel, as she was known, took part in the girls' education, teaching them the three R's. From a young age, the children were expected to help with domestic chores. Every evening, the girls were set sewing duties. This caused some resentment because their brother Branwell was free to pursue his own leisure activities, drawing, map making, and the children's favorite pastime, writing plays and stories. They refer to this in their secret language as scribble mania. On the 5th of June 1826, the Reverend Bronte arrived home from a clerical conference in Leeds with presents for each of his children. He brought Anne, the youngest, a doll, Emily was given a toy village, and Charlotte a set of ninepins. However, it was Branwell's gift, 12 wooden soldiers, that sparked new creativity among the Bronte children. Nine-year-old Charlotte records this event. Papa bought Branwell for some soldiers at Leeds. When Papa came home, it was night, but we were in bed, so next morning, Bramwell came to our door with a box of soldiers. Emily and I jumped out of bed, and I snatched up one and exclaimed, This is the Duke of Wellington, and it shall be mine. When I said this, Emily likewise said one should be hers. When Anne came down, she took one also. Mine was the prettiest of the whole and perfect in every part. Emily was a grave-looking fellow, and he was called Gravy. Anne was a queer little thing, very much like herself. He was called Waiting Boy. Uh, Branwell chose one. He called him Bonaparte. The Bronte children all collaborated on a variety of projects, including the young men's plays and in writing miniature books and journals. As teenagers, Charlotte and Branwell were very close and collaborated on many projects. When Charlotte was in Rowhead School, her 15-year-old brother Branwell was so anxious to see her that he walked 20 miles to pay a surprise visit. He must have been exhausted as he returned home on the same day. 
Charlotte's concern for his safe return is obvious in her letter dated the 17th of May 1832 and begins, Dear Branwell, As usual, I address my weekly letter to you because to you I find I have the most to say. I am feeling exceedingly anxious to know how and what state you arrived home after your long and should I think very fatiguing journey. As time went on, the Bronte siblings split into two creative groups, Charlotte and Branwell, Emily and Anne. In November 1834, the two younger girls began to secretly write what they referred to as diary papers. These were a mixture of fact and fiction, a commentary on their current situation and a projection of their hopes and wishes for the future. The papers were sealed and hidden away with the intention of opening them on a future birthday. Here we see Emily working in her room. She's sitting on a stool with her portable writing desk on her lap. Her dog Keeper lies on the floor next to her and Anne's dog Flossie and a cat are asleep on the bed. Anne is the youngest member of the Bronte family and she had the least formal education. Yet ironically, she was the one who worked for the longest period of time outside the family home. Her first difficult post as governess, she used as material for her novel Agnes Grey. Anne's second book, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, addressed a very controversial theme and it is often regarded as the first feminist novel. The subject matter, a woman who had abandoned her drunken, abusive husband, garnered lots of criticism and the most common adjective attached to it was crude. Anne is the only member of the Bronte household who is not interred in the crypt of St Michael and All Angels at Howard. She died at Scarborough aged 29 and was buried with only Charlotte and two friends in attendance. The sisters' journey into publishing began with a book called Hoods. Charlotte was snooping at Emily's desk and she discovered some excellent poetry. She devised a plan that Emily and herself should self-publish their work together. Emily was furious that Charlotte had invaded her privacy and refused to cooperate. Anne, always the peacemaker, produced some of her own poems and suggested that all three sisters collaborate on a poetry book. At length, Emily agreed to the plan on condition that they publish anonymously under made pseudonyms. This project was not a commercial success and so the sisters changed tack and decided that they would each write a novel. Charlotte Jane Eyre was the first to be published and it was a resounding success. The novel was written in diary format yet in the final chapter the eponymous Jane addresses her audience directly when she declares, Rita, I married him. This scene is echoed in Charlotte's personal story. In 1852, when all her siblings were dead, her father's curate, Arthur Bell Nichols, asked for her hand in marriage. When Charlotte told her father about this offer, the Reverend Bronte flew into a rage. He was amazed at Arthur's impertinence to propose to his famous daughter. Charlotte was firmly instructed to reject him. Arthur was devastated at this rejection, to the point that he resigned from his post that he had held for seven years. The parishioners in Howarth were sad to lose their popular clergyman and they bought him an expensive pocket watch as a parting gift. However, matters did not end there. Over time, a secret correspondence developed between Charlotte and Arthur. In April 1854, the couple arrived at an understanding with the Reverend Bronte's grudging consent. Charlotte's announcement to her friend Ellen Nossie echoed Jane Eyre's statement when she wrote, Ellen, I'm engaged. The marriage took place on the 29th of June, 1854. The night before the wedding, Patrick decided that he was not well enough to walk the hundred yards to attend his daughter's wedding service. Charlotte searched the Book of Common Prayer for a solution. A solution was found. Her good friend, Margaret Wooler, replaced Patrick and accompanied Charlotte to the altar. The couple went on a month-long honeymoon in Ireland, spending a week in Arthur's childhood home, Cuba Court in Banner. Charlotte was in poor health when she arrived and Arthur's Aunt Harriet took tender care of her. Charlotte was delighted with her Irish relatives and she began to see 
Arthur in a new light. They attended church at St Paul's and visited many of the sites in the neighbourhood. Her friend Ellen Nussie remarked. After her marriage, a halo of happiness seemed to surround her. A holy calm pervaded even in moments of excitement. The following January things changed when Charlotte became pregnant. Her body could not sustain the burden of carrying a child. She died three months later on the 31st of March 1855. On her death, Charlotte's estate passed not to her father but to her husband of nine months, the Reverend Arthur Bell Nichols. Nichols stayed at Howarth Harsonage with his ailing father-in-law until his death in 1861. The former coldness between the two men gradually disappeared and by the terms of his will, Patrick Bronte left the bulk of his estate to his beloved and esteemed son-in-law. Thus Nichols found himself heir to an enormous collection of Bronteania, including a substantial number of paintings and drawings. Although Arthur had worked in Howarth Parish for 16 years, he was not appointed to the role of perpetual curate. His disappointment was such that he returned to Banagher bringing all the Bronte objects with him. He took up residence in Hill House with his Aunt Harriet and in 1864 he married his cousin Mary Ann Bell. By every account the second marriage was happy, a happiness based on solid companionship and mutual understanding rather than passion. Arthur was perfectly open with Mary about his feelings, telling her that he had buried his heart with his first wife. Arthur's home in Hill House became a virtual Bronte museum. With Charlotte's portrait hanging over the fireplace, Bronte watercolours decorating the walls, the Haworth long case clock in the hallway, and a chest containing Charlotte's bridal trousseau and other items cluttering up the social space. Mariana was very understanding and the family annually commemorated both Charlotte's birthday and the anniversary of her death. But Arthur also held a second wife, Mary Anna, in high regard. When he died in 1906, he left all his worldly possessions to Mary Anna. However, there was one exception, and that was the portrait of Charlotte by George Richmond. This Arthur donated to the National Portrait Gallery in London. So Mariana was now faced with the question of what she should do with the vast collection of Bronte relics. She was determined that they should go where they would be most valued. She arranged for the Bronte Parsonage Museum to have key pieces. Merely for a nominal sum. But it was important that other individuals and institutions should have an opportunity to expand their collections as well. So she sold items at a public auction held in Sotheby's in London. In 1914, when Branwell's pillar portrait and the fragment of Emily's portrait were discovered on top of the wardrobe in Hill House, Mary Anna wrote to Charlotte's publisher, Reginald Smith, requesting his help to ensure that they would enter the collection of the British Portrait Gallery in London. So, long after his death, Mary Anna continued to honour Arthur's wishes and ensure that the Bronte family legacy would go to where they would be accessed and appreciated not only by Bronte scholars but also by the public at large. Mm -hmm.